So, all right, bases on these two. And then later on, I'll go home and edit everything later. But right now, you're live on Facebook and you're live on um, America's Funniest Home Video. No. Uh, <laughs> Um, you're live on that. So I'm going to sit down here with them. All right. And I think we got everybody going. All right. So hopefully I can't see nothing because I don't have anything turned towards me. Uh, what we're trying to do is, and it will not be this clustered right now for a while. It's just right now. I want to make sure that stays on because that's actually operating that one. So what we're trying to do is show everybody that military, when we're out, different things that we look forward to. Uh, different things that we expected while we were in the military. I got a better idea for this one. Well, yeah, we gotta try to do something here. Alright, so anyway, uh, everybody's always wondering how important the military was to them, and I've been noticing this is not a political channel by any means. There's no politics involved. Um, however, people can ask their questions, and then I'm gonna go back, and we're gonna ar interview a couple army guys, interview a couple, um, other people we have to put microphones on that's fine but right now the whole idea of this is to just get a viewpoint of when people were in the military what they did when they're in when they got out what their expectations were um, what they're seeing now and it, it, it like I said I understand that this is probably going to go no farther than my community um, and we already know that yeah everybody calls but we all know that we're local heroes and you know, we, we love being called that, whatever. Actually, the truth of the matter is, we don't like being called heroes. Because the ones that call us heroes are the ones that usually want something. They're the ones that are trying to use the military as a political propaganda. They're like, oh, I love those vets, and then they do nothing in return. There's a lot of vets that come home that have uh, PTSD. Of course, then all the major vehicles come by where you can't hear them. Um, and there's a lot of guys that they never returned home all the way um, Vietnam World War II but today all I'm gonna just show you is what we do and why when we get around everybody seriously does it have to be loud the time that I'm <laughs> trying to do something Le leave it to some, well, ah. anyway so the whole point of this is just to get a different perspective on the military and what we do when we get out and why it's a good idea to try to uh, get your college and why it's a good idea to um, just do your best at everything you do. And while we're, while we're talking, I'm going to ask some questions. And like I said, this is the pilot for this. So if it looks like I don't know what I'm doing, well, you already know I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> but I want everybody to know that no matter what, there's always a place you go. So first off, we've got Luke Dolman. He is from Quincy, Illinois. He's probably one of my oldest friends. I used to go to church with him and his family years and years ago. And then one of my newer friends, uh, Marine Corps, he was in the Marine Corps and everything else. And what we're going to do is we're just going to talk. And we're going to kind of throw things back at each other, ask different questions when things pop into our heads. There's nothing scripted about anything we're doing. But to me, it matters. And this comes from one of my oldest friends, Dr. McGinley. He interviewed everybody from World War II. And uh, before he died, he got a chance to meet the last guy with the red line. And if any of y'all don't know what the red line is, it was Patton's supply chain during World War II. As Patton was going through Africa, uh, he was moving faster than his supply chain. And when Patton goes, uh, he sent a letter back, and they're like, hey, you got to slow down. We can't keep up with you. You know, we can't get food and stuff um, to these guys. Patton said, look, you just need, in a letter he wrote, he said, look, you need to send gas and bullets. The men can eat their belts. Because he had to keep moving because he had a tactical advantage of surprise. Now Dr. McGinley was never in the military but he interviewed all these guys and he found out that that was one of the most strategic things that happened in World War II in order to win against the Germans. Uh, however, he never would have known that if his neighbor didn't come by and say, hey, how come you never interviewed me? So, being was what we do, we have a lot of guys out here at the Veterans Home, a lot of women. We have people in the Marine Corps Leagues. We have guys that are in. We have guys that are getting out. And their story has never been told except to each other. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk to each other. And I'm going to have each person introduce themselves so that I can go back and I can edit this and I can put their names and where they're from. And we're going to start with Luke. And Luke, if you just tell whatever one of these two you want, your full name, uh, what branches you were in. Uh, just kind of what you, a little bit what you did while you're in and stuff, and then Nathan, after he's done, I want you to introduce yourself and do the exact same thing. 
Now, my name is Luke Dolman. I'm from Quincy, Illinois here. Uh, 59 years old. Uh, joined the Marine Corps in 1978. Uh, served six and a half years. Then uh, got out, come back home here. Uh, tried to start a family. And uh, decided to go back in the military. Couldn't get back in the Corps, so I went in the Navy for 14 years. And uh, retired in uh, 1999. And you said you were Navy and Marine Corps, those were the only two branches you were in? Yeah. Okay. Right. Nathan, what about you, buddy? Oh, Tell my name. Full name, where you're from. You're going to say where you're from because you're not from here. Yeah. My name's Nathan Smith, and <clears throat> I'm actually from Redmond, Oregon. I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. I was in for four years, got out, moved to Quincy for a girl and a job. Have neither now. That's all right. But neither a girl nor a job. Well, I have a job now, but those, the ones I had that I, were my prospects when I got out. I'm should not, we go? Should we go funny with why you say you don't have a girl? No, I'm just kidding. He's yeah. not like that. I'm, <laughs> swing. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I've been in Quincy for two, three years now. I'm good friends with Jeff. I've been. I worked various jobs, and now I'm a bartender at one of the local bars here, and I really enjoy it. And going to college. All right. And of course, my name is Jeffrey Jansen. A lot of y'all know me. Uh, the whole point of me is I'm nobody important, I'm nobody special, but I think these guys around here need their stories told. And we're not going to ask about DD-214s, we're not going to ask about any. We are going to joke around about different things that we did in the military, um, all the kind of funny things, you know, kind of like sneaking in the Coliseum over in uh, Rome so we could sneak into the Coliseum. I'm sure we all got different stories and everything else. Uh, so Luke, what did you all do when you were in? And like I said, what what you know? How many guys were with you when you first got in? Did you go in right out of high school? Yes, I went in right out of high school. What high school did you go to? Quincy Notre Dame. I'm sorry. I'm kidding. I'm the only one on my family that went to senior high. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I know, right? Yeah. Uh, left left out of Quincy here. Uh, supposed to take bus down to St. Louis, but. Uh, Wound up having to go all the way to Springfield, take a train down to St. Louis. Because the recruiter was late in the Quincy. Yep. Then uh, right. went went out, went to Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego. Uh, completed my training there. Uh, then I went up to infantry training school at Camp Pendleton. And went overseas to... 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, over on Okinawa. Did my time over there. Uh, went to Korea, Philippines, Thailand, Tinian. When you first went in, what was the very first thing you did? When you first got in? Do you still remember your boot camp days and where you went yeah. to boot camp? I went to MCRD in San Diego. How was that? <laughs> Little, Did you get yelled at? Yeah, got yelled at. <laughs> I got to see uh, the gold footprints where JFK stood. JFK stood on the footprints. Yeah, he, he stood. He was, JFK was a marine. No, he went. He visited MCRD oh. San Diego, and they there's a set of footprints they painted gold for where he stood at in the where they have the platoons yeah. form up. Uh, I didn't have to spend any time in the Quonset huts that they had from Vietnam era. They still had a few there when I was in, set there in 78. Uh, the obstacle course wasn't as extensive as it is now. Did they still have, did they have the regular barracks then when you were there? Yeah. I had, we Overlooking had, the airport and everything else? Yeah. Oh yeah. We, airport, you, lights from the airport was on all night long. You hear jets coming in and out. So what, do you think anything was different from boot camp then, today, than it is today? Just boot camp, you know? Oh, yeah, Compa do you think it's different, or do you think it's still the same? You get in, you get yelled at, you go to the fleet. Well, they get yelled at, but they don't get yelled at the way they used to. Really? Well, I mean, I mean before, you know, even up, at, up through my time, they could still get in your face uh, and get right up close to you. They just... They weren't supposed to touch you, but there were the times where <laughs> you got touched. Did, did anybody I, die when they went through boot camp with you? No. 
In other words, boot camp is more of a stress. Uh, it's it it's supposed to create stress to get you ready for combat. Did you guys do Mount Sarabachis? We did all. Where they dump your foot lockers out in the middle of the floor and basically strip you down naked, tell you to take your mattress, go into the head, and then sit there and to get yelled at 24/7, so you're naked inside of a head. A lot of people look at that like, oh, that's just gross. But it was actually to teach you to be able to think without anything on, you know, be able to. Yeah, yeah that happened a couple of times. <laughs> we forget about that. Did you guys have, uh, what was that stuff? Uh, oh, what was that? Aftershave we cleaned with and we put on. Bulldog. Did you guys Bulldog. have Bulldog back then? No. You're gonna, did you guys have Listerine back then where they dump it everywhere? Yeah, they had Listerine and then... Uh... Anybody try to get drunk off in the middle of the night? I'm sure there guy was. We had a few guys that we had the the uh, <laughs> only the Marines get drunk off Listerine. <laughs> the uh, cans of uh, brass cleaner that was uh, brass. <laughs> well, it was not the brass. We had the the cans with the the like the cloth that was all shredded up. You take and you, you do that. Yeah. You clean your brass with that. We had guys that would uh, try to chew that to get the the alcohol out of it. They get they get sick. Now, yeah. yeah, let's compare this a little bit. Nate, where'd you go to boot camp at? MCRD, San Diego. But you're from Oregon, right? Yeah. So how far away from that is where you live? Uh, it's probably driving, probably a I don't know, 15 hour drive. Wow. So let's see here. When you went there, what was your experience like when you first got there and everything else? I'm trying to compare these two here, you know, trying to show people it's really not much different other than age. In fact, I think we're still using the same stuff they did during World War One. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, Marines but, always get the leftover stuff after it's been around really. for a while. Uh, very, very similar experience. They are a little more uh, strict on hazing, but they're just a lot more under the table about it now. Like back in the day, they used to be a lot more open. Now it's just a little more quiet but i mean still get it still get in your face still yell at you still run you into the ground every single day hey uh what, what's the quarter deck you oh yeah the quarter deck forgot about the quarter deck whole nine yards so still the same same experience did you guys all had the same because like when we were there there was only one chow hall but it had four sides to it and you yeah. picked the side you went in i think the chow hall is still there yeah we didn't get yelled too much in the chow as long as we stayed quiet but if you did step out of place, well, you had a bunch of drill instructors at you, freaking yelling at you. I do remember that. I'm well, like, first, first phase, you were, they, you, they were, you were there to get in, eat, get out. <laughs> uh, once you you advance, got further, second, third, fourth phase, you 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 got a little bit more time to eat. But the first phase is it was you were in and out. Now, when you were in after boot, you said that you then joined the Navy after the Marine Corps. Right. Did you have to go through another boot camp or anything, or what'd you have to do to train was, to get back in there? I mean, did they look at you a little differently, or how'd that work? Well, I was I was supposed to go through uh, what the Navy calls time other or uh, OSVET or other service veterans training. Right. Which was uh, I was going to spend about three weeks up at uh, Great Lakes going through. Uh, training, getting some indoctrination in naval history, uh, uniforms, what the Navy does, what, you know, to be, how to be a sailor, and then I would go to my, my A school. Well, then, uh, when I got to Great Lakes, I found out that a yeoman down in St. Louis had said that they had changed my paperwork, saying I was going through boot camp. And they for hold on for anybody that doesn't know what the Great Lakes means, that's up in Chicago, uh, uh, Lake uh, Michigan. No, Great Lakes Naval Training. Center. Yeah, Lake Michigan. Yeah, yeah, okay. Lake Michigan. Uh, that's where the Navy has their uh, CB trainings and stuff like that. That's their only. I think that's their yeah, only boot camp. Hospital Corps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's the only boot camp. That's right. right now. It's the closest Navy Fed we got. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just in case you want to know what Great Lakes is, that is up in the Illinois area. That's up in northern Illinois. So, uh, I was, they, they messed up my paperwork, and I had to go through, I had to spend the three months going through. When you first went in, were you married when you went into the Marine Corps? Or? No. 
Okay. When did you meet Mindy? I know that sounds weird. He has got a beautiful wife by the name of Mindy Dolman who helps out with um, some military stuff and everything else. The reason why I'm asking that is because I, when I went in, um, and I think even with Nathan, we had some guys that were married going in. Yeah, we had a couple. That one that came out. And now, when you went to the Navy, though, you were married. Yeah. Correct? Okay. I'm, I met her after I came back, after my, uh, my first tour overseas by myself in Okinawa. Uh, came home, and girlfriend I had been with in high school, we had broke up. And uh, I literally... She beat him up. My, my wife literally <laughs> ran into me. And beat you up. Uh, she was working at the <laughs> library kidding. here in Quincy, and oh, sure was that she was She thought it was. Uh, she thought it was my brother coming to pick my dad up because he was working down there as a uh, janitor. And uh, she come. She seen the car pull in. Thought it was my brother. Come running out of uh, the children's department, which is downstairs, and uh, literally ran into me in the doorway. <laughs> and realized it wasn't my brother. Ah. So. And at this time, you were in the transition from the Marines to the Navy, or did no. you already join the Navy at that time? No, I was. This was You're still uh, in the Marine Corps. This was, this was coming back from oh. Okinawa. Okay, Okinawa. Uh, for anybody who wants to know, Okinawa, we have a. Uh, the Marines have several bases over there. Uh, hold on, real quick. I gotta check that, Nathan. Hold on, Rick. I gotta turn that off. I don't. Everybody doesn't know I'm live right now. Hold on. I'm going to turn that off. Nice. All right. Sorry about that. All right. I really got to do something different about this one. Ouch. I know, right? That I hurt. I know. So, you were in Okinawa. Nathan, let's go back. Yep. Let's transition over to you for a second. All right. So, when you went in, let me ask you this. Why? I mean, really, why did you... I don't know much about your personal child life. I probably don't want to know. Because uh, <laughs> you scare me. Uh, but why the um, why the Marine Corps? I feel like I share a similar story to a lot of people my age. I was in third grade when I saw World Trade Centers get hit, and at that at that point, was, was that the like, first time? Yeah, that was the first time, right? When the first time the World Trade Center, or was yeah. it 9/11? 9/11. It was 9/11. Oh my God, now I feel old. Yeah. First time, first I was in the Marine Corps sure. during 9/11. We were deployed out on the 24th Mule Marine Expeditionary Unit. I know. Wow. I know. I forgot you're that young. Yeah. Holy 26. crap. Well, I was uh, I was in third grade and I decided I was like, okay, well, I want I want to fight. I want to be I want to be in the military. And soon after that, I saw a Marine Corps commercial I was sold. I mean, uh, from like third grade, I wanted to join the Marine Corps. That's why I went. In when now, I was what commercial grade. was it? Was it the Knight in Shining Armor, the one that kept having the night one, or was it a different one? Oh, I don't remember. Just had to do with blues and kicking ass. So I was like, ah, oh, this looks awesome. I'm going to join the military, why not go in the best? So, that's why, two weeks out of high school, I went in. And did my four years. Wow. So did you was, like it? Did uh, you deploy? They were desperately tried to. Just wrong place, wrong time. So you never deployed? I never got a chance to. What, was, right, your, I, what was your MOS? I, I was a 2841 uh, radio technician. Alright. Uh, whenever we ask anybody what their MOS is, for anybody that's non-military or a different branch, the MOS specifies your schooling, what you did, what your profession was in the military. Some people hold a couple of them. I know Jesus has two or three because he was a radio operator and he was an 0811 and a 25, 20... Yeah, I cross-trained the radio operator. Right. So I spent a lot of time with those guys. Would you guys but... believe when I was in with Panama, when I was stationed down in Panama, one of the guys, and I didn't even realize this, they literally... One of the guys that was in with me, he went in like two years before me, right? They just got rid of Morse code. They literally just put a cease to ever teaching it again. I was like, they were still teaching it all the way up till 1999, 2000, when I was down in Panama. And one of the guys like, oh man, I just got went through this entire school with Morse code and how to do all this Morse code stuff. <laughs> because he was radio, but they had to learn it. Yeah. He goes, and now they actually discontinued that entire MOS. Why did they discontinue it? I don't know. Just, oh yeah, I think it was... Know. Well, if the Marine Corps, you know, if you get, like our new commandant said, we're too extended out in too many different areas, it's probably just to focus on the main areas. Otherwise, we overextend ourselves, having a little grievance, you know, little that we do. I, uh, hmm. I, I ended up in... I got out of boot camp and MCT, which is Marine Combat Training. 
and then you go to, I went to my job school in Coronet Palms, ended up there for a year, which is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. <laughs> oh, under 20 degrees. 29. 29 stumps. stumps. And then I ended up in North Carolina. I raised my hand for every deployment, just wrong place, wrong time. Just never, never got a chance to go. He, he, nobody taught him, don't raise your freaking hand. Then you'll go everywhere. Yeah. You literally just don't raise your hand. <laughs> so you lived out at uh, 29 Palms there. Yeah. For about a year. Well, I did know that the uh, one of the best chow halls in the Marine Corps is 29 uh, Palms. Oh, it was amazing. I actually like 29 Palms better than North Carolina. I was Man, I had North LA Carolina. a couple hours away. North Carolina, it was hot. It was like muggy hot. I wasn't used to the humidity because Oregon is a dry heat. All right. So um, I wasn't used to that. And it's just the Palms. area of uh, where Camp Lejeune is at, it's just, I don't like it. Like the water smelled bad. It was discolored. So where did you do a lot of your trainings at then? Was it just over in Pendleton and Lejeune or did you go up into Alaska or Norway or did you do anything? I mean, besides the desert, uh, of course. A lot of a lot of uh, field ops in Kentucky and North Carolina. Right. Now, when you were in and everything else, are you glad you went in? I know some guys, when they went in, you just said you didn't get deployed too much, but... And I know that uh, a lot of guys, not you, or but I know a lot of guys when they get out, the, no matter what they did when they're in, they struggle. And they struggle dealing with civilian life. They struggled with people kind of telling them what to do. They struggle with alcohol addiction, drug addiction. They struggle with uh, post-traumatic, not from being in combat, just for the fact that we got used to a certain lifestyle. Now, now I think I love the military except for the hurry up and waits. And the people in your face all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up and wait. <laughs> it, that, no, seriously. It, no, it, no. They're, they're, everybody thinks we joke around about that. But I think no matter what year you served in, we all know that when the commander sends something down for a formation at 10 hundred, we're lining up at 0700 because as it goes downhill, they want to make sure we're all there on time. 15 minutes early. Man, I mean, there was a lot of games, but I think it kind of taught us who we were and what we did while we were in. I mean, would you guys not agree with that? Yeah, a lot of yeah. patience. Yeah. A lot of patience. Now, you never got married or anything when you were in. No. And was your mom worried to death about you when you were in and stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mom, I'm two doors down. I miss you. You're going to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, she, was, she was really happy when I got out. Ah. Uh, and now you live in Quincy trying to get your life back together in order and everything. Like a lot of guys, me too. Yeah. Um, I met Nathan over at a trucking company. He went over there and uh, been friends with him ever since. And uh, I know a lot of guys, um, they're always looking for something. Now, last night we had a military takeover night of Native Wings, and there was about, there was a few of us there. And everybody was just talking. There was no requirements on anybody you know what i'm saying we just went and had a good time i know when guys get together they talk a lot easier and stuff like that so just uh start with you luke just, what are some memories i mean literally just what are some things that you remember that at, when you were in what you did what are some fun things you did with the guys what are some funny moments that oh my god i can't believe that we did this and everything else well won't say uh, the guy's name like running a bike up a flagpole going streaking through the quads no. Repelling off the... <laughs> repelling from the third floor of the barracks. <laughs> no, we, we, we didn't... We didn't repel off the third floor of the barracks. We just... Uh, Calling tried, dominoes and giving tried, them a GPS coordinate where you're at so you can get food out in the field. <laughs> yeah, I do that. Uh, try climbing up the barracks to go to the third floor. Or the roof. Yeah. Uh, we just uh, running, running PT and, and typhoon, or actually running a, a physical fitness test in a typhoon. <laughs> you're trying to run against typhoon force winds. <laughs> you're Had not making Japan. your time. <laughs> yeah, that was Okinawa. <laughs> yes, that was fun. Then, uh, if you, when I was stationed down at Camp Hansen in Okinawa, uh, the wind was blowing just right, 
uh, you get the smell from the uh, crematorium that was just outside the base where the Japanese would cremate their their loved ones after they passed away. The wind was just right. That smoke would blow back on base and no, smell, smell that, smell that. <laughs> just the, the visiting the different countries was was a, was a unique experience. Why? Uh, one of the things that a lot of people know about you. I know that you were the commandant of the Marine Corps League um, Gem City Detachment 790. Why do you continue doing stuff for the military? Why do you continue doing all the parades that you do and volunteering with all the different... I mean, why are you doing all that? I mean, I know you're out now and you miss it, but I mean, what's what's your... Why? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Everybody's like, oh, they think they got to... But you, you, you're you one of the very few people that know you don't have to join nothing when you get out. You don't have to do anything when you get out. Yeah. But why do you continue doing all that? Well, it's... One... Uh, at, when you first get out, you don't want to be. A, you don't want to be. A lot of guys say, "I don't want to be around any military. I don't want to be around anyone like that. I want to forget about all that <laughs> shit." Uh, but then, uh, after a little while, you start to realize, you know, you, you miss you miss being around guys like that. And my dad was World War II veteran, and there was I knew a lot of guys that were either World War II or Korea. A few Vietnam veterans, and uh, you just realize, you know, you see some of them get together, and you you realize you, you got to be, you got to get back, you got to get together, you got to talk. It's the only way you can help each other out. Right. Because I know that uh, you're probably one of the calmer of the guys I know compared to dealing with everything. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of us. I'm not going to mention any names. Jesus Delgado, Chris. Not going to mention any names. Chris, Jesus Delgado. Oh, wait a minute. I mentioned names. Darn it. <laughs> well, we still have that kind of edge to us. Like if somebody said, you know, we, we, we kind of want to still snap back, you know, but you kind of seem to have lost that quick. Well, of, it's... You use diplomacy over... <laughs> it's it's the, the thing... If they don't... If they don't know you, it, it's... It's to... to keep people off guard because right. right now you know I I can I can like that I can I can go you know go right back to, to snapping right back at someone it's just uh, you just have to just take a look and see hey you know I don't have to, to jump right back into someone's face or I'm going to try to use tact try to get out of the situation or talk to them about it and then you know if they don't want to be that way then i can change i know a lot of people when they see us do stuff like that that's not back they think we're insulting when we have jokes against other what a lot of people i think a lot of civilians a lot of people that didn't spend as much time in the military sometimes don't always understand is that's how we actually talk we have our own talk military doesn't matter what branch if we served, like I said, yeah, yeah. I understand Nathan's the youngest one here. I kind of come in the middle, and you're the oldest one. And I, we've got, we're going to do some army guys, navy guys later on, uh, not today, but later on. I, I know a lot of people. It's funny because we will put like jokes online, you know, and we have jokes like Pogue. They don't always understand our jokes, and all of a sudden they're going to defend somebody, and we're kind of laughing. I'm like, you just have no clue. That's our yeah. way of actually talking to each other. It's our way of actually communicating. And if we don't talk that way to each other, then we question, what did you actually do when you're in? What, you know, especially with Vietnam vets and everything else, these guys had it, they were in hell. And not all of them we understand. I don't, I think another thing is a lot of people don't understand is a lot of, there's a lot of support structures right. for everybody that actually deploys and stuff. And that's not a bad thing, but people, they, they still want to do the jokes, but they're afraid if they do the jokes, they haven't earned them when actually they have. Uh, the jokes are about a community, a tight-knit community of men and women in the military to where there is no sexism, there is no insulting. It's all just banter back and forth to show, you know, I was in, you were in, these are the jokes, we all have it's stories. Camaraderie. Is right. It is. And we all work together in the end. Uh, Nathan, we're going to move on to you real quick here. Sure. I know I'm kind of, like I said, today's a pilot for all this, but... 
your coming of age right now, I guess you could say, is I notice with your age and everything else, and sometimes I forget how young you are coming out. That's not a bad thing. I mean, I know you've always been awesome with me. You always came out and you've always come and helped when you when we've asked you. You've always done different things. And I know you're not at the level for the time that like somebody like Luke has been out or myself. But what do you feel now when you first got out of the Marine Corps? You know, all past stuff set aside. When you first got out and everything else, you know, what were your feelings? Like he said, you know, I don't want to get around any of these guys. I can't stand anybody. What What about you? I mean, how did you feel when you got out? Because you probably have a little bit better memory than we do of when you got out. Because I remember when I got out, I didn't want to be around anybody. I got sick of Marines. I got sick and tired. Then I realized there were no, none around anymore. Yeah. But how are you getting around? Because you came all the way from Oregon to the, the middle of the United States to the Midwest into Quincy, Illinois. I mean, what what's your initial reaction? Because you still have that first knee-jerk reaction on, you know, what is it? What's it, it, in your mind? What's going through your head? It, it, was, it was similar for me, but I, I was really, really tight with some of the guys I was with. So I honestly missed them when I got out, but I didn't miss the, the Marine Corps itself. I was like, anything Marine Corps associated, I'm like, push away. I'm like, I'm done. We'll I'm say done the foo-foo you. games instead of the foo games. And I'm like, we're, we're done here. But as I... As I go on, like, those feelings have subsided, and I'm a little more like, okay, it's all right. Like, it is what it is. I enjoy Are, are you missing the guys more and more now? Because you got, you, you got so used to being, it's like. Oh, yeah. It's like you're bored. You can walk one door over, and you have a friend there you just hang out with. You always had someone you could do something with. Yeah. So that's, it's Sorry. definitely different getting out, because you don't, you don't have that at all. I always like to give examples so it gets into you guys' heads so you guys can throw it back at me. My example best would be, we're at home all the way through high school with our siblings. I've got an older sister, I love her to death. She's probably one of the greatest people I know. But man, did I want to get away from her. I couldn't stand her or anything else. I wanted to strangle her half the time. I know as her little brother, she wanted to strangle me almost all the time. <laughs> and I know once I got in and everything else, you know, I was like, hey, yeah, I'm away from my family. I'm doing pretty good. And all of a sudden I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Where's my big sis? Oh my God, where's my mom? Where's my dad? Where's my, where are my friends I was with all the time that I couldn't, you know, I got sick of the groups and the cliques and stuff in high school, but then when I got in the Marine Corps, I, I was like, I started missing them. Then I realized when I got out of the Marine Corps, I started feeling the same way about, and it's like everybody in my platoon or my company, I was with 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, I was in Echo, but then I switched over to golf after my last year as in. I actually started missing all the guys and everything, including all the first sergeants and everything else, because it was kind of like they always had our back. It's like all of a sudden you realize they weren't, you know, we were, we may have not been the nicest to each other, but I could always count on them. Mm -hmm. We may have not been the nicest to each other, but when we went out somewhere, we did it with each other. And all of a sudden I started missing that camaraderie. Yeah. What say you? We'll start with Nathan. Yeah, what's, what's your question? Just what, when I told you that, what went through your mind? Like, you know, all of a sudden I compared oh. it to a sibling, you know, we got out and all of a sudden. And I do notice that growing up, whether anybody's military or not, a lot of times when they get away from their siblings going to college or anything else, you know, yeah. when they come back, their bond with their siblings are a lot tighter. Oh, absolutely, yeah. 